Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Buckeye Weekly Podcast. I am Tony Gerdeman here, as always, with Tom Orr. Tom, how's it going? Tony, great. We get to talk about a little Big Ten football today. Always like to talk Big Ten football, and it seems like this is like another example. We're talking Michigan Rutgers today. Watching that game, it just feels like there might just be no easy games in the Big Ten East this year, which is like, that's actually good. That actually makes football interesting, which two two thumbs up. I'm for it. (laughs) Yes, today is our Michigan Monday podcast uh, discussing Michigan's 20 to 13 win over Rutgers, which had some ups and downs, had some lulls, had some things that really make you start questioning just how potent this Michigan offense is going to be. And I had to, you know, after seeing it, just looking at the box score now, we watched the game, we all watched the game, but it's like, was this game played in October? And I had to check, no, it was still September, but it's late September. The leaves are turning. The Michigan offense is uh, turning. The defense is getting maybe a little dried out. I don't know. But you're starting to see some questions about what's what's happening at Michigan. And now what we don't know yet is, is this just one of those conference games? Or is this what we see every year for Michigan? And we won't know that just yet. But I don't know that this was a great sign for the Wolverines. Right. You don't want to take any individual one game and say, aha, this is now exactly what's going to happen moving forward. But that was, I mean, like if this was going to be a Michigan team that can only win rock fights, like that's a lot like, I mean, that was, that was just a straight up good old, old school big 10 rock fight on Saturday. And you're right. I mean, you talked about the ups and downs. You look at, you look at the uh, EPA per play chart for that game. And Michigan's just looks like, it looks like a mountain. It goes up, 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 up. And this goes down, 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 down. And Rutgers is like an upside down W where it's like, oh, started good. Then it got really bad. Then it got really good. Then it got really bad. It was just, I mean, it was like a real bizarre roller coaster of a game where the two teams were just kind of going in opposite directions the whole time. I know every single Michigan fan listening to this right now heard you say upside down W and they're saying, hey, you idiot, that's an M. Well, but it's not like a block M. It's because it wasn't like str- it wasn't straight vertically. I mean, M's M's don't generally have uh, angles on the side. They, 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 those are that's a ninety degree line there. So, okay. all right, I'm sure I'm sure Michigan fans know the alphabet, Tony. Even if you don't, mm. you know what? This is not about me. This is about <laughs> the listeners, and I don't like like you being turning it on me. The EPA you talk about just for the regular people like me. You look at the first half yardage versus the second half yardage. Michigan had 233 yards of total offense in the first half, 42 in the second half. Is that good? Is it that just means they're being efficient, right? No, Tom. In fact, it doesn't. I mean, mm-hmm. they're being inf- efficient. In fact, they're being inefficient. They did not pick up a first down on third down after the first quarter. They were 0 for the rest of the game on third downs following that first quarter. And you just looking where they even where they had the ball, um, average field position, starting field position in the second quarter for Michigan is 45 yards. Third quarter, it's 48 yards. Fourth quarter, it's 36 yards. Like they had field position and they couldn't really do anything with it after, um, you know, like after that first quarter was really in, in the second quarter, they had, they had a big play with a 51 yarder, uh, 51 yard pass play, but they did lead 20 to three at the half. Three of those points came from Greg Schiano when he went for it on fourth down. And they, they, they went for it. They lost the ball and downs three times in this game. Credit to Greg Schiano. I don't have a problem with that. I don't have a problem with you going for it. My biggest problem in all of that is Jim Harbaugh kicking a field goal inside the five with five seconds left when he could have thrown it one more time. And the fact that he didn't speaks to me of his lack of confidence in Cade McNamara right now. I, I you can get a quick slant. You can get you can even get a fade in five seconds from down there. And they chose not to. And that was kind of disappointing. Yeah. I mean, and you know that that was it was what they were at the two yard line at that point with five seconds. You have a timeout like you can you can just yeah you like you said throw a quick slant, throw a quick out, something like that. You know, it, it's it's close. If it was seven seconds, I'd have a massive problem with it. If it was Three seconds, I totally understand it. Five mm-hmm. seconds is in a little bit of a gray area, but you're right. I mean, it does it does sort of speak to a lack of 
you know, a lack of complete confidence in Cade McNamara. Cause that's, that's a throw that you can make. That's a throw that, you know, this is, this is not a difficult throw. This is not something where you, you know, the concern is pass protection because it's just like you snap it and you get it out immediately. But you, you can kind of see why he might not have total faith in Cade McNamara when you look at the rest of the game. It just, it was just kind of like, you know, we, we, they, they just, they just bludgeoned people to death for the first three games of the season. And was like, I wonder what it's going to look like if whenever they can't run. I wonder, you know, wonder if if this is just they're choosing to run because they can't throw the ball, or if this is because they they're choosing to run because they can, but they can still throw the ball, or if this is you know they're running the ball exclusively because they really don't know if they have a good passing offense. And I feel like we kind of started to get the answer to that on Saturday, and it was not probably what Michigan fans were hoping for. And given Michigan's typical passing. Play and offense. I guess I shouldn't be too critical of the five seconds when you figure for a Michigan pass play to work, it has to be a, a play action and then a long boot. And then you find a tight end dragging or perhaps even a fullback. So that's a seven, eight second you know, drive there. So let's go ahead and forgive him for that. Michigan was stopped on the ground in this game 112 yards rushing on 38 attempts, 2.9 yards per carry. This is the first time that Blake Corn was held under 100 yards rushing. He went 21 carries for 68 yards. Wasn't stopped in the backfield. Neither, neither was Hassan Haskins. 12 carries, 41 yards. But Rutgers sold out to stop the run, and it worked. And I can't say Michigan didn't make them pay for it because they won. And you had a, a couple of – Mike Sainer still had a 51-yarder. Roman Wilson had a 38-yarder. I, I, neither of those are really actually downfield. Those are – more crossing routes that went and I'm disappointed that really those two were only targeted four times total. They only caught one pass each. I, I think when if Rutgers is playing that man defense and that's a way to take advantage of it on those crossing routes, again, when you're not taking advantage of that stuff, that speaks to a, a, an issue with McNamara, but just overall, he was nine for 16, 163 yards with a long of 51, which was, as I said, one of those crossing routes. I, I don't leave here thinking that um, he's progressing. I, it just feels like not that they're hiding him, but they're sure not putting him out there in front of the world. Right. Well, and and the other piece of, you know, you mentioned how short the th- Sanders Dell pass was. It also was 15 seconds before the half. Like that was just a, you know, a little check down, like see, you know, Maybe, maybe you maybe you break something and you can get into field goal range, and that's exactly what happened. It was second quarter, 15 seconds left. They get the ball. Rutgers has turned it over on downs. Little check down to San Marcel, and then boom, you know he's he's down to uh, he, he was 51 yards, but it was you know five yards in the air, whatever it was. Outside of that, eight for 15 for 112 yards. That was that was the day. That was when Michigan can't run the ball. That's what it was out of Cade McNamara. It's like uh, that's that that is a big red flag to me. That you know, I mean, yes. They were trying to kind of run out the clock, but there was there was a point in the second half where Michigan went the whole third quarter without a first down. Like at some point, you have to be able to throw the ball. Like that is a very important part of football because you are not going to be playing defenses that have defensive lines like Western Michigan or Northern Illinois for the rest of the season. Like you are going to be starting to you're starting to get into Big Ten season now. You're starting to get into teams that are going to be able to stop you when you're trying to just run the ball very predictably. And now you kind of you're now you're sort of wondering like okay, is is the other shoe about to drop here? Because you can you can bludgeon people in you know in the non conference schedule. When the going gets a little tougher, you're going to have to be able to win another way. And I'm not totally convinced that Michigan can win another way. Yeah, I, I there was AJ Henning had two targets, no catches. He had, he's not yet been kind of the downfield. Red, he's more of the slot guy. They're all kind of the slot guy. That's the problem. The Cornelius Johnson, Dalen Baldwin are the outside downfield guys. AJ Henning, he, Cade McNamara threw it to him once, kind of downfield, and it was nowhere close. McNamara finished the second half one for four passing, or yeah, one for five, sorry, passing in the second half. And I was charting his the distance that he threw the ball two for four on passes over 10 yards downfield in terms of completions. And that's, that's not great. That's a very conservative approach. 
uh, which is fine when you can run the ball. But even when you can run the ball, you should be taking more shots because the defense has, is forced up. And now that they were forced up, they weren't able to take advantage of having eight guys, nine guys in the box to defend the run. And, and so that just makes things even worse. And you wonder if that's something that they – you can't just snap out of it. I mean, you've got to take some shots. Losing uh, Ronnie, uh, Ronnie Bell, as we know, mm-hmm. is big. That was a few games ago. You've got to be developing these other guys instead of just – maybe they should have been throwing the ball a little bit more rather than just pounding on people that can't stop the run. Maybe you should have been taking advantage of those opportunities more because it's not going to get easier this week at Wisconsin to run the ball, probably not easier to throw the ball. And, yes, Caden McNamara has gotten some a lot of snaps now, but he's not been able to do much with them. And the receivers haven't been able to get as much experience. Like if you want A.J. Henning to be a downfield threat, I I guess maybe this past week was a good opportunity to practice that. Uh, It didn't end up working out. But there are guys here who haven't really been relied upon yet, who are going to have to step up and make catches, make plays, bail the quarterback out. One thing we haven't really seen from Cade McNamara either is the, the jump ball stuff that has been a Michigan staple for a few years. Does that come back into the picture? You've got Cornelius Johnson. You've got Dalen Baldwin, big guys who can go up and get the ball. You're not going to ask any of your slot receivers or Roman Wilson to do that, but maybe it's time to start relying on them to make some plays rather than just, we're just going to keep it between the tackles and Blake Corn will eventually bail us out. Yeah. Again, there has to, there has to be a plan B there because plan A is not always going to work. And you've, seen that over and over and over again with any any team you watch plan a does not always work you have to have another way to win and you're right i mean it, you're you're exactly right on the point that there, there are probably some missed opportunities in september while everything was going great and it was all sunshine and lollipops it was like well yes it's working now and then what and i think you look at ohio state and you look at michigan right now and you can just with Ohio State, you can kind of see that there's some stuff happening behind the scenes and there's some new guys emerging and that this is not necessarily going to be the same team in November that it is in September. And we just did a long podcast on that. I did the morning show with Mark Givler on that. If you listen to our postgame uh, instant reaction show from Saturday night against Akron, you'll hear us talking about that as well. You've got these freshmen emerging and it's like there's a lot of talent on this team all of a sudden and it's going to look a lot different two months in a, from now than it does now. Because right now, you know, right now you look at Michigan, it's like you know, Michigan is playing much better than Ohio State right now. If Michigan's just going to, Michigan's going to have to figure out a way to up that level of production. You don't want to be the peaked in September team. And Michigan has had a lot of peaked in September teams over the years. You know, that's, that was always a John Cooper staple was, you know, you come out and you just blow the doors off of people in September and maybe early October. And then while everyone else is getting better, you're just kind of like, Still where we were, okay, and then eventually you get caught up with. I mean, 1996 is the perfect example of that to me, or, or 1995, where Ohio State comes out and just annihilates people for the first part of the season. And then you look towards the end of the season, and all of a sudden, it's, that was not just a Michigan, you know, losing to Michigan thing for John Cooper. The week before the Michigan game, they're at Indiana against a very bad Indiana team in 1996, and they need a strip... Uh, you know, strip, fumble, run it back for a touchdown to beat a bad Indiana team on the road by 10 points. Like that, that was the big, you know, the big red warning flag there. You got, you, you're going to have to see some changes from Michigan moving forward or some significant improvements in a couple different places. Otherwise it feels like that's where this season is headed for them. Yeah. It is hard to see like how much better is Michigan going to get sticking with the offense? Because We know the running game is going to decline. That's not because the running game is going to be bad. It's because the defenses they're going to face will be better. This is what happens to everybody. The numbers go down in in October. They go down in November because the competition gets tougher than it is in September. The passing game and and the receivers, the passing game can also suffer as the season goes on because the weather gets worse. It's not a time where, yeah, you're getting more experience, but that doesn't mean Conditions are going to be getting worse, so that doesn't mean your passing game is will get better. We've seen that for saw it for years under Braxton Miller and JT Barrett, who weren't great passers, and it would show the later the season would go. I don't see a great passer out of Cade McNamara yet, so I'm not going to expect him to be better in November 
than in terms of completion percentage than he is now. He may be smarter and know where to when not to throw, when to throw. And I don't think he's yet thrown an interception. So he's doing well, you know, uh, holding on to the ball and being safe with it. But also at, at some point, you've got to be a little bit more aggressive if you're going to move the ball. And we'll see how that goes for them. Tom, the Michigan defense, we've had questions about that. How are they going to stop the run? We have a very, uh, I don't want to say low opinion. We question also the secondary. Basically, we question the entire defense. Let's not uh, uh, beat around the bush there. Rutgers rushes for 196 yards on 42 attempts, 4.7 yards per carry. That's, that's not great for a Michigan defense that will need to stop the run this season. Rutgers is an average rushing team. They're, they're not a bad team. They've got Isaiah Pacheco is a really good running back. He's, he's had success here and there. They don't always block for him well, and they don't always have the passing threat to really make the running game shine. But I'm not saying Rutgers is bad. They are a, a worthy opponent. And so this being a close game, Rutgers had the ball in the, in, to, to tie the game at the end, but they uh, quarterback Noah Vedral was uh, stripped on a, on a run. And so it just – there was opportunities for Rutgers. They moved the ball well enough on the ground, which is really the measurement that I'm, I'm looking at right now. Just 196 yards rushing against Michigan's defense. What does that mean for Wisconsin? What does that mean for other opponents? Uh, again, not a great sign for a defense that is still trying to figure out what it is they do best. And not that they've been bad this year, they haven't, but now this was the first time they kind of got punched in the face. Well, I think the concern there has to be that Michigan, very clearly the plan from weeks one through three was run the ball, lean on the defense, you know, be able to be able to control the game with the running game on offense, lean on your defense to control the other team and, you know, win without having to rely on the offense. Uh, the yards per average yards per rush on Saturday, Rutgers 4.83, Michigan 2.95. You are not going to win very many games when you're getting outrushed by almost two yards per carry, unless you're really leaning on the on the passing attack. It wasn't like Rutgers had a ton of explosive plays to bump that number up. It wasn't like they were, you know, there was a 70 yarder and a 50 yarder, and that's why the number it, they didn't. It was just a hammer and a nail, just constantly, just bang, bang, bang. Four yards, five yards, six yards, six yards, four yards, three yards, six yards, just constantly. There was just, there were so many just Noah Vedral quarterback draws. It just felt like all the whole game was just Noah Vedral quarterback draws. And it wasn't, you know, he's not, he's not Braxton Miller. He's just mm -hmm. a guy who just, you keep banging on the door. You keep banging. It was like a battering ram, just banging on the door, banging on the door, banging on the door. And then the door started to give towards the second half. Like you could, you could see the door starting to give. It, you, it's amazing. Rutgers was minus three in turnovers and still almost one on the road at Michigan. That, that shouldn't happen. If Michigan is the team that, you know, it looked like Michigan was the first three weeks of the season, that shouldn't happen. Because there was that, this, the whole game was just missed opportunities for Rutgers, it felt like. You know, they had the, uh, I mean, you mentioned the fourth and 10 right before the half, which was, you know, that's, you, you, I, you like the aggression from Greg Schiano there to go for it, but you didn't. So that cost you three points. There was a uh, a play in the in the uh, second quarter where Rutgers has driven the ball down into Michigan territory. It's fourth and one at the Michigan thirty-two, and they do kind of a trick play where Noah Vedral like turns around like he's confused, like "Hey, what's going on?" And then Isaiah Pacheco comes up and then takes a snap, and they're just going to try and push. I mean, like you, you've seen teams do this before, and he fumbled the snap. Well, and that's the thing. It was not only was it that they, you know, that he fumbled the snap, but it was also, there was like a delay. It was like, he got up there and it was like, if he had snapped it right away, it was there. But then he gets up under center and it's like, pause, pause. And it's like, please look at what we are doing. Everyone, our quarterback is confused. What could it be? And then he fumbled the snap. So it was like, if he had caught, if he had snapped it right away, you know, th then it's a first down. Cause it was just Rutgers kept like Rutgers had a bunch of extended drives. Even when they're not scoring, they had extended drives. There was not a lot of three and outs for, for Rutgers on offense. That's a concern for Michigan because you're going to be playing teams with much better offensive lines than Rutgers has. You're going to be playing teams with much better skill talent than Rutgers has. You're going to be playing teams with much better quarterbacks than Rutgers has. 
if Rutgers is able to kind of just like battering ram against your door for, for four quarters and, you know, you can kind of see that door bowing a little bit. I, I have bad news about next week against against Wisconsin. What Wisconsin's probably going to do because I don't think you know. I think much like the Rutgers didn't trust Noah Vedral. I don't think Wisconsin has a super high uh, opinion of Graham Mertz right now. So how how is that defense going to hold up against the the Wisconsin running attack? Because this is not a great Wisconsin team, but it is a Wisconsin team, and Wisconsin teams have typically not been great opponents for Michigan over the last few years. And it's a Wisconsin team in Madison, which mm-hmm. makes them even tougher. Rutgers was just had just two three and outs in that game. They had four drives of 50 yards or more, including a 91 yarder. Michigan only three drives of 50 yards or more, including their first two drives, which went 74 yards and 72 yards, four scores. And then after that, uh, I think I wrote it down. They put up 146 yards on their first two drives and like 141 yards the rest of the game or whatever Mm -hmm. it was. And just, I don't want to say they they mailed it in at that point. I think maybe they forgot to mail it in and it just sat on the dining room table. You know, got like maybe you put some newspapers over top of it and then, you know, you throw you throw a newspaper away the next day. And you're like, oh, crap, forgot to mail the game in. <laughs> we almost lost that one. Boy, uh, that was a that was a scary one. The, the a better offense would be able to take better advantage of this Michigan defense. I think that's clear. But the fact that this offense was close enough when it's just it's average, Noah Vedral can make plays, but can also make mistakes. And if it just takes one pretty good day from an average quarterback, it looks like to make this Michigan defense pay if the Michigan offense isn't going to be better. Now, the Michigan defense, again, like Aiden Hutchinson is still very, very good, probably great at this point and is a pain. Nikai Hill Green flashed a couple of times. Saw Josh Ross with some tackles for loss. Still would like to see more out of the defensive line. At this point, I don't expect to. They're they're just trying to be like better than the like collectively better than the individuals because individually you don't expect much. I mean, I, I saw you know, you know we don't really see much from Chris Hinton. He plays a lot and he he doesn't really doesn't really make plays. You're seeing Ohio State defensive tackles. They've got, I think, 10 sacks on the year they, and between like five different defensive tackles. They're making plays on the interior. Chris Hinton, you don't really see him make plays. He's just there. That, that goes for a, a lot of these guys. David Ojabo, the defensive end slash outside linebacker, forced to fumble at the end. They're trying to get more out of him. It's just they're not really connecting interior and exterior yet, and I'm not really expecting Backing them to you. I just think this defense just has to hold on and try to keep teams under like 21, 24, and then hope the offense in the running game gets going to score the 27, 31 that is necessary. I, I just, you can't expect this defense to hold everybody to 17 or 13 like they did Rutgers. Well, and that was going to be one of my questions for you is is this a Michigan team that can win a shootout? Like you've got to be able to win in a couple different ways. Is this a Michigan team that can win a shootout? Can they beat, you know, pick a team, Michigan State? Can they beat Penn State? If the game gets into the high 30s, low 40s, is this a Michigan team that can win a 42 35 kind of game or 45 38 kind of game? I don't know that I think it is yet. I think there is a way they can win. And, you know, th- that's progress. That is substantial progress for Michigan, <laughs> is there is a way they can win and they can win consistently. I don't think this is a team that can get to 11 and one because there's going to be enough good teams on the schedule coming up that they're going to, you know, there are going to be teams that drag them into a shootout because the defense is good, but it's not incredible. You know, you can, you can watch the Michigan defense and go, they're pretty good, but what is Travion Henderson going to do against this Michigan defense? Because you, you know, if, if you're getting consistently kind of hammered for five yards, when there is a much better skilled player on the other side of the ball and you're breaking some of those and the wide receivers are much better than the wide receivers from Rutgers, you're not going to be able to hold Ohio state to 17 points, 13 points. You're going to have to score probably in the thirties. Now with the Ohio state defense and the way the Ohio state defense is, is playing so far this year, 
Can Michigan score 30 points against the Ohio State defense? Yes, friends, they can, especially if the Ohio State plate defense is playing the way that it is. Can Michigan score 40 points? Can And can Michigan's defense hold up against Ohio State if Ohio State gets, you know, to enough to keep Ohio State from getting into the 40s? I, I still don't know the answer to that question. And it feels like I, I remember there was a, a Sam Webb tweet about uh, about the uh, you know Ohio State Minnesota game week one where it was like oh Minnesota's laying out quite a blueprint you know to you know the implication being to beat Ohio State it's like I feel like the blueprint is there to beat Michigan right now for Ohio State and it's just get the ball out into space to your playmakers you know sp- you spread the field out a little bit get a little push in the middle of that offensive line and just let Travion Henderson eat and you could you can kind of see. That the, the you know the, the, Travion Henderson is probably not getting eight carries in that Michigan game, and if Travion Henderson gets 15, 20 carries in that Michigan game, I, I don't think there's any way Michigan holds him under one hundred and thirty yards rushing. Right? I mean, am I yeah. am I wrong there? No, I'm thinking that's one of those games where you do everything it takes. You're not worried about anybody else on your team's feelings. If that's thirty eight carries for Travion Henderson, he's going to carry the ball thirty eight times. He may rush for two hundred sixty yards doing it, but you're going to go. All stops, and I don't care if somebody's going to stomp off the field during the game because they're when not going to happen. Carries. Never, it's unprecedented. When when would that happen in Michigan Stadium for Ohio State? <laughs> well, <laughs> it, it depends on uh, if this is a pregame thing and, and you want to leave with a bunch of birds uh, <laughs> flying in the air. But no, yeah, it, it certainly wouldn't happen uh, in a game. But you you don't worry about that. Like I. Sorry, I can't worry about getting somebody else some carries. I have to go with the hot hand because right now it's 20 to 20 and it's the third quarter and I need seven. And and you do whatever it takes. And yeah, I'm with you. And we're talking about, this is, this is the crazy part. We're talking about, yeah, you just spread them out and run Travion Henderson. But you're spreading the defense out with Chris Olave and Garrett Wilson and Jackson Smith and Jigba <laughs> against Michigan secondary. And it's like, well, that, that's fine. We'll worry about that later. Right now, you've just got to give the ball to your best player, the freshman running back who is you know, 18 years old and didn't play football last year. That's the only way to win this one, or that's the best way to win this one. And the thing right now is Ohio State has a couple of ways to win this one. But also, uh, they would have to stop Michigan. And maybe by that point, they'll be more equipped. They should be more equipped. I'm still not convinced the Ohio State pass defense inter- in the intermediate of the, the defense can really contain anybody. So I, I always expect Michigan to score more than they should against Ohio State just because of the emotion, and that's what happens. Even when with bad teams, Michigan was still open with a touchdown drive. You're like, well, how did that happen? That shouldn't have happened. Like, well, that's just what this game is. For Michigan, like a, a shootout, I'm thinking it just for the rest of the season, to me that sounds like a 31-27 because you're talking about how many 17 yard or how many 17 play drives between them and say Wisconsin and Nebraska? It's like you're talking about a two hour and 45 minute game, basically, because it's like one 17 drive followed by a 13 play drive. And you know, it's you only get the ball four times in the first half. So you better make it count. So it's, it's almost hard to have a shootout because the possessions are fewer. If we're talking about Michigan being able to run the ball and then also maybe not being able to stop the, the opponent as much as they would like. So, I just don't I don't know mathematically and logistically how they can get too many points up there just because of the style of offense and the style of offenses they'll be facing. Yeah, and you know, the other the other issue that I think you're going to run into as an opposing team against Michigan is, you know, if you're if you're looking at the deep passing defense as potentially the the weak link there, when's the next time they're playing a passing team that, you know, a team that you you look at and go, well, that team's going to, you know, has the opportunity to throw the ball over anyone, you know, all over anyone on, the, on, on their schedule. It ain't Wisconsin. It's not Nebraska. I mean, I know they've got what Northwestern coming up after that. And then uh, Michigan yeah. state after that, I mean, you've got another month to get this sorted out, but you know, you do have Penn state on the schedule. You do have Ohio state on the schedule. I don't know that Indiana is a real big concern in terms of throwing the ball all over the field. You know, who is Maryland. Keep an eye on that Maryland game. That's that may be a game where you find out that that may be the game where you either go, Michigan has solved it, or Michigan is doomed by the thing that we've kind of been wondering. Are they going to be doomed by this? Because it seems like they might be doomed by this. Because if I mean Talia Tongvalo has been flinging it all over. He's been he's over what 340, 350 yards, whatever it is a game. 
they've got they have some skill talent there. They've got Raheem Jarrett there. You've got you have some skill talent there at Maryland. It is not an outstanding team, but it's a team that can hit some big plays. And and you know you hit a couple big plays, and then you know you're up in the 20s, and then you get up in the 30s, and then Michigan has to find a way to answer that. And you know that that's that's a game that I think. I mean, this is as crazy to say, you know, as this would have sounded before the season. Is the Maryland game a bigger threat to Michigan than the Indiana game? I mean, that would have sounded nuts a month ago. But is I mean, is am I am I crazy there? No, I don't think you are. Right now, Michael Penix leads the Big Ten in interceptions. Him and Graham Mertz. You've got Talia Tungavailo, who has, uh, as you said, 335 yards passing game, 75.5 percent completion percentage, 10 touchdowns, one interceptions. Right, right now. He's got the second best group of receivers in the Big Ten. They have playmakers. They're running the ball. That offense right now is is bad news for Michigan the week before the Ohio State game. So on the road as well, it it sets up for, yes, the ultimate uh, roadblock trip up type trap game where Maryland can do a bunch of stuff. But also Maryland just sometimes just collapses because they're Maryland. <laughs> and and I, as I said early in the season, like I didn't expect them to be good throughout the season because they always, their quarterbacks always get hurt. They always lose guys and you can just set your calendar to it. And they, they won't have to, Michigan won't have to face Dunga Bailoa. right now. It looks like they will, but we're only four games in and I'm not wishing injury on anybody. I'm just past history has shown. Like Maryland has played five quarterbacks in a season before. They've had to play linebackers at quarterback. This is just what happens at Maryland, you know. So I'm not speaking out of turn here, speaking out of school. Like that's just the nature of the beast for whatever reason. The the old uh, angry Iowa running back hating God, you know. That's mm-hmm. that's that's just the way college football is. Yeah, and and you know, I mean, if if we're going to go through concerns for Michigan, Jake Moody missed a 47 yarder. That would have iced, you know, potentially iced the game. Mm-hmm. They were up twenty to thirteen with uh, under two minutes to go, and had a chance to kick a field goal to pick at a ten point lead. Missed that, you know, and and Rutgers Rutgers had a uh, they they missed a what a twenty nine yard field goal in the fourth quarter that could have cut it to twenty twenty to sixteen. I mean, there were there were some missed opportunities on both sides of the ball, and you know, for Michigan. You, you kind of look at that and if you're the favored team and you, you know, you're looking at missed opportunities, you kind of have to be looking big picture. Like, okay, how, how big of a concern is it that my field goal kicker missed a kick? If you're the underdog, like Rutgers, you're kind of looking at it like so close. If only we had picked up one, you know, you hadn't botched that snap in the, on the fourth and one, you hadn't missed the 29 yard field goal. You know, that you're looking at that kind of in a, in a different way. If you're the big underdog uh, before we move on, I do need to Tony. I just need to say the name of Rutgers kicker just once. Yes. Val- Valentino Ambrosio. Do, what, what do you think his ethnicity is, Tony? Do you think he's Dutch? I don't, it's, it's hard to say. Uh, it sounds like his ethnicity is um, the es- ethnicity of love. That This is a very romantic <laughs> name. And you can just hear the music playing like the harp strings behind it. So is I don't it, know. Is it hard to kick when you're talking with your hands, my column? You signaled for the step. I was just talking. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, it, it, that still might be only the second best uh, extremely Italian Rutgers name in the last few years behind uh, 2019 interim coach Nunzio Campanile. Mm-hmm. I, 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 I love, I, I, as, a, as a native of New Jersey, this is just a wonderful taste of home. The, the wonderful, wonderful names you see when you scan through the Rutgers roster. Sorry, sorry to derail us back to Michigan. Well, no, I didn't have a quarterback a couple years ago, Giovanni Rossigno. I mean, mm-hmm. there's, I mean, they, they've had a, they've had a few of um, your, your Italian American friends there. The, the Rutgers was in Michigan territory four times in the second half inside the 38. And they came away with 10 points. So they scored a touchdown the first time, a field goal the second time, missed a field goal in the fourth quarter, and then uh, lost it on downs at the Michigan 38 in the fourth quarter as well. And and really, again, this is one of those things where a a better team beats Michigan here. Like Michigan led 20 to three, didn't score in the the 20 to three at the half, didn't score in the second half, had no ball movement, as I said at the start of the show, 42 yards of total offense in that second half. I, I don't know if that's just um, packing it in 
trestle ball type of stuff or just being pushed around by Rutgers. And, and I think maybe there's a little bit of both, but also uh, that Jim Harbaugh didn't change his approach. Like the approach in the first half was the approach in the second half. It's just Rutgers stopped it in the second half. And that's something he's going to have to now reflect on and decide how are we going to answer to that? What are we going to do next time? Are we just going to keep doing what we're doing? Or should we do some other stuff in the first half to maybe spread out how we're going to do an attack during the entire game rather than just, okay, we're just going to do this in the first half, and then we're going to do the same thing in the second half, and it'll work because it's always worked, always meaning just this season. <laughs> For the last three weeks, it has always worked. You know, that, that is a little concerning to me that it was like Michigan didn't seem to have a counter punch. Like, you, like I mean, this goes back to plan A, plan B. You, you have a plan. Okay, the other team adjusted. You said you saw Rutgers like crashing safeties down real hard a couple times. That that seemed to kind of counteract what Michigan was trying to do on offense. And it's like, well, if they're going to crash safeties down, like you throw play action over the top of it, and they never did that. And is that is that a function of not trusting Cade McNamara? You know, thinking that you're just going to try and you know Python this game and just squeeze the life out of it and just and and get get out of there with with whatever win you can get. I mean, that's, that is a viable strategy. It's not going to be a viable strategy against better opponents, which are coming up. I mean, let, let's go through the rest of the schedule and you tell me games which you are 90% sure, 80% sure. Mm-hmm. Let's just say 80% sure that Michigan is going to win this game. Okay. At Wisconsin. No. At Nebraska. No. Northwestern at home. Yes. That's, that's the one for me. At Michigan State. No. Indiana at home. I'm at 60% tops. Yeah, I, like 60, 70% there. I could, I could, I mean, this is wild, but yeah, you've got an, another Indiana that's like, yeah, maybe at Penn State. No. Maryland at Maryland. No. Ohio State at home. Mm-hmm. It's, it's like they're four and oh. You can just, you can just sort of see a couple cracks on the face of the dam right now. And this is, this is not like an incredibly brutal schedule. But you've got five. You've got five road games remaining. Now, now you get to go on the road. You got five road games remaining. None of them are gimmies. You know, Wisconsin probably doesn't look as tough as they did at the start of the season. But Nebraska looks better than you probably were expecting at the start of the season. Michigan State looks better than you were expecting at the start of the season. Penn State looks better than you were expecting at the start of the season. Maryland looks better than you were expecting at the start of the season. Those are your five road games. Plus, you have Ohio State at home. Plus, you have Indiana at home. I mean, Northwestern's the only one that I look at and go, just write the, write the W on the schedule right now. So then you're at five. Okay, that's good. You got seven, t- you know, some seven things that are some variation of toss up between, you know, you're somewhere between 75, 25 and 25, 75 on those games. This is going to be very interesting to see how Michigan responds. Because it's like, I mean, every, like I said, everything, you know, go back, go back a week. And everyone's ready to, you know, crown Jim Harbaugh king of the world. This, if this is a year where it's another four and zero start that turns into an eight and four finish, is that enough to keep his job? Because I think there's going to be a real familiar ring to that. That I don't know if that's going to go over real well for Michigan fans. Which is, I mean, it's crazy. Think about where they were a week ago, and you, you look at the rest of the schedule. It's like, yeah, like eight and four is still on the table there, and I. I there are just the, the 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 cracks that you can see forming. It's not it's not a disaster yet. There's still time. I mean, Ohio, just like we said with Ohio State, there's time to improve. There's time to fix this. There's time to find new players. There's time to rework schemes. There's time to get better at throwing the ball, more comfortable throwing the ball, find another receiver, whatever it is. But you got to do it. Like you you got to do it now because if they lose a game or two before the bye week, that's going to be an ugly bye week before. You know, if they lose to at Wisconsin and then lose at Nebraska, that's an ugly bye week in in uh, Ann Arbor. I'm looking at those five road games, and I'm thinking, uh, I'll ask you, Tom, are they more likely to be four and one out of those, or one and four? Um, hmm. I guess I'm gonna go. I guess I'm going to go four and one, but I would say they're substantially more likely to be three or two, mm-hmm. three and two or two and three than either of those. You know, I, I don't, they're not, they're not going to own five, 
Right. And they're not going five and oh. I, I think, you know, I think you're, you're splitting those, you know, th- three, three and two is like reasonable because they should beat Nebraska. Nebraska is good. But if Michigan is what you sort of think Michigan is, which is at least competent, they should beat Nebraska. But it's going to be it's going to be close. They Wisconsin is like that's about that's probably about coin flippy to me at Michigan State like that. I mean, that's going to be an ugly, low-scoring rock fight. And <laughs> that's that's a game Michigan State, I think, is very comfortable playing in. And that that's also a must-win game for Michigan. A must, must, must. If you lose again to Mel Tucker two years in a row, like, that's that's a problem. And, you know, at Penn State, I think, is a loss. Maryland, I mean, Maryland's just, they should win that game. But you just look at the matchup, and it's like, yeah... I don't know. I, you know, there's a, I think the, uh, the at Nebraska and at Maryland games are kind of polar opposites to me where one team is going to rely on its defense. One team is going to rely on just trying to outscore you. Those are both games. Michigan should win, but I'm not, I don't have like an incredibly high level of confidence that, you know, like absolutely they're going to win those games. They are favored by a point at Wisconsin this week, Michigan. Is that correct? Uh, that sounds right. Yeah, I, I think they'll be favored in all of those except for Penn State, depending on where Penn State is. It, well, if Michigan State is still undefeated, I guess that's another one where perhaps the Spartans would be favored. I feel better about Michigan's chances at Wisconsin than I do Nebraska, based on the the sheer number of mistakes that Graham Mertz is making. I don't know how Michigan's going to move the ball that much against Wisconsin. But if Graham Mertz is throwing two pick sixes, pick sixes a game, they don't need to move the ball that much. <laughs> if Nebraska just doesn't lose the game, like if Adrian Martinez doesn't lose the game, I think they will win that game because of his legs, his ability to keep plays alive, make life miserable for a Michigan defense that really just wants to keep stuff in front of them. And once things start spinning and you know, picking up third downs on, on uh, with the, with the scramble, just keeping drives alive and keeping – the same guys out on the field and they get tired. I, I think I like Nebraska's chances better than Wisconsin's just because Wisconsin, as I said, I can't, I can't deal with their offense right now. Although maybe what they need is, is uh, they're not that different than Rutgers in terms of the running game and just the uh, average nature of everything and the average nature of everything combined with those are going to be two difficult road environments for Michigan to handle. So let's see how they do it, how calm they are. Because there are times where Cade McNamara doesn't seem all that calm, and he's not being pressured. Like, he didn't get sacked. I don't even know if he got hit much in, in this game. But he was just like, mm, you know, it, it was not, not a lot of there there, but we'll, we'll see if uh, he can kind of step up and just grow. And maybe one, one performance on the road like that, if he, if he controls the game against Wisconsin, that can carry them. That can build that confidence. That can create his own level of confidence where now, okay, we can, we can win with this guy. Let's give him some more to do. Yeah. I mean, it, it at least answers a question. It doesn't solve all the issues, but at least answers a question. Cause you have, I mean, he hasn't had to play in a true road environment and obviously there was no crowds last year. And then this year it's been four home games. So let's see what it looks like in front of, I mean, you're getting to you're going to Camp Randall at a good time because number one the weather is not going to be nightmarish and number two there's probably a little bit of uh, wind out of the sails of the uh, Wisconsin fan base right now after that loss last week so it's not going to be necessarily the most raucous Camp Randall you've ever been in but it's going to be a pretty you know that's always a loud environment and then yeah in Nebraska I mean they same kind of this kind of the same thing kind of copy and paste like yeah it is it is a fan base that's probably a little disheartened right now but you know, if you can get a big win, that kind of turns things around. Before before we go, I do want to ask you, Michigan State, currently 4-0. and Here's who they have before the Michigan game. Western Kentucky at home. Should be a win, right? At Rutgers. I mean, that, that's going to be a uh, that's going to be a bet the under game, I think. Uh, but and then at Indiana, I mean, is Michigan State 7-0 and going in? And then they have a bye week going into the Michigan game. Is Michigan State 7-0 and going into that Michigan game? I, I want to see it before I believe it because I could see them losing either of those two road games. Again, I'm a very big proponent of, of the road environment, and so that clouds a lot of my thinking 
and all of my college football stuff as I tend to side with the home game and then look at it from there. I think Indiana, the Hoosiers will have a, a bye week before that game. But am I going to be shocked that Michigan State wins either of those? No, not, not at all, because those two teams, you know, they are what they are. Michigan State seems to be more than what they are so far. And maybe, maybe the pumpkin, uh, the carriage turns back into a pumpkin before one of those games. But right now I'm, you know, I'll, I rode with the, with the Spartans against Nebraska and it almost cost me time. It almost cost me dearly. Uh, and so I'm, I'm a little bit uh, gun shy right now. And let me just throw this out for this weekend. Here's Western Kentucky this year. They, they beat UT Martin, which doesn't matter at all at army lost 38 35 army's pretty good this year that's a it's a road game against a tough unusual team lost 38 35 and then had indiana home last week and lost indiana 33 31 western kentucky is not a gimme putt either so the, this is this is one of these things where it's like you could tell me michigan state was 7 and 0 you could tell me michigan state was 5 and 2 or maybe even 4 and 3 <laughs> and i kind of go yeah i could see that yeah i'm with you there uh, anything else before we get out of here and, and we'll have plenty of time in the coming weeks to talk about all of these Michigan games coming down the pike. It's going to be really, really interesting. And it starts this week with Wisconsin and, you know, there's really, there's like a two week break in there where they have a bye week after Nebraska and then, and then they get Northwestern at home, Northwestern at home. They should be able to do whatever they want, meaning 30 to three or 20 to three, a blowout of epic proportions. That will be a very boring rewatch just because at that point, Jim Harbaugh is like, you know what? Just get in, get out, go home, spend time with the kids and uh, just call it a day. And, and then, because then you've got Michigan state the next week. And so I'm looking forward to all of this. It's good. I like when Michigan is good. It makes all the rivalry games good. All the other big 10 games that they're playing in more interesting. And, you know, Michigan Rutgers turning into one of my favorite rivalries, you know, that's two straight years. <laughs> down to the wire uh perhaps this is going to be michigan's next big rivalry as as we tried to make it that way back uh, a few years back and you know it, it was there for a while and we need to get it back again yeah you're a long way from 78 nothing this is that, that has turned into a really interesting uh i mean this is that, that's the uh greg shiano coming out like rutgers rutgers was dead as a program two years ago and you know greg, greg shiano may have his flaws as a coach but uh man Coaching Rutgers is uh, that is that is what that guy was born to do. He has figured that out now. Like, just don't leave. Just stay there. Just sign a line to lifetime contract and just, you know, go go to a bunch of, uh, you know, eight and eight and four kind of uh, seven and five kind of seasons. And just that's fine. Just just do that forever and go to, I don't know, whatever the 2024 version of the International Bowl is. And, uh, you know, that, that's that's a perfectly good living. And, uh, you know, it you know, like you said, it's, it's a little more interesting when Michigan's good. It's a little more interesting when all the teams in the big 10 East are at least competent. And mm -hmm. it's like, you don't have any games. It's like, why? I remember two years ago, like getting in the car, going to Rutgers, like, why, why are we doing this? Like, this is just an enormous waste of everyone's time. You don't feel like that this year. Like this is going to be an interesting Ohio state game this week. It was an interesting uh, Michigan game last week as well. Yeah. It's, it's good when there's, there are questions and intrigue as opposed to how long is this game going to be? And so it's, I'm looking forward to all of it. So that will do it for today's show. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you for watching. As always, you can find us at BuckeyeScoop.com. If you're not yet a member, please join. If you are a member, thank you very much for that. You can also find all of our videos at YouTube.com slash BuckeyeScoop, all of our podcasts, all of our interviews, all of our streams. Anytime we drop a video there. So just go to YouTube.com slash BuckeyeScoop. Subscribe at the bell and you'll be notified anytime we drop anything. So thank you all for watching and listening and we will talk to you guys tomorrow.